Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, this is a new episode of the financial statements uh, at the Peterson Institute, uh, which I'm uh, delighted to introduce. I'm Nicolas Veron at the Institute, and today we'll talk about Danske Bank, uh, very now uh, well uh, documented case of um, financial malpractice. And uh, I'm very grateful to Jesper Berg for having uh, accepted to uh, talk about it. Uh, he's the head of the Danish uh, Financial Supervisory Authority, the FSA, or in uh, Danish uh, Finance Tilsunet, I'll probably mispronounce it. Um, Jesper studied at University of Copenhagen, where he got a master's in economics and management in 1984. Uh, he spent a year at IBM in San Jose, but then went into public service at the Danish Central Bank in 1985, where he stayed until 2010, with two interruptions, uh, three years at the IMF uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, four years at the ECB uh, in the early 2000s, where he was in charge of uh, capital markets and financial structures unit. Uh, he also uh, got a part-time uh, MBA at uh, IMD in Lausanne. Um, so at the Danish Central Bank, uh, Jesper dealt with a number of different issues, all of which are relevant for today's ses sessions, payment systems, market operations, financial stability in particular. Uh, then he spent five years in the banking industry in the early 2010s at New Credit, which is a major domestic Danish banks, bank in charge of uh, regulatory affairs and then member of the executive board. So I guess you were a competitor of Danske Bank at the time where when many of the events we'll talk about uh, happened. Uh, and in 2015, he was appointed the head of the Danish uh, financial supervisor. Uh, and also became an adjunct professor, professor of finance at the uh, Copenhagen Business School. Uh, Jesper has been very vocal in a number of financial services uh, related debates. I will just mention his book, which uh, whose title I won't try to pronounce in Danish, but translates as The Fall of Finance, which was published in 2009, so on the early steps of the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, many other articles, particularly about the European debate on banking resolution, where Danish has a uh, Pioneering uh, position, uh, Denmark. I mean, um, David Enrich uh, studied at uh, Claremont McKenna College, uh, where he graduated from uh, in 2001. I think he founded the first online newspaper of that college, so that's an early vocation. Uh, I think it it may be the first time, or maybe I forget the previous instance where we have a professional journalist as one of the speakers uh, in this series. So thank you very much for. Uh, um, blazing that trail, uh, David. And then indeed he um, uh, started a career as a reporter uh, at Dow Jones uh, Newswires, a Cleveland Plain Dealers, a Wisconsin State Journal, so Philadelphia Daily News, and uh, of course the Wall Street Journal, which he joined in 2007, stayed for a decade uh, in London and New York, and um, uh, uh, got his reputation as a uh, one of the world's leading experts in financial malpractice. Uh, he's worked on uh, US and European banks, particularly on the LIBOR uh, scandal. I will mention uh, his three successive uh, books uh, published in the last five, six years. The first one is on the LIBOR scandal, the spider network, the wild story uh, of a mass genius, a gang of backstabbing bankers, and one of the greatest scams in financial history. I love the subtitle. Um, the second, that was in 2017 on LIBOR. The second one, which is particularly relevant for today's session, is not on das Danske, but on Deutsche Bank, Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an epic trail of destruction. Uh, and the last one uh, published last year, Servants of the Dan, Giant Law Firms, Donald Trump, and the Corruption of Justice. With that, Jesper, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Nicola. Now I'll see if I succeed in sharing my, my screen. Uh, 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 is it up there? Brilliant. Uh, uh, thanks to you, Nicola, and, and also thanks to David. I'm honored to be in such good company. Uh, I have two punchlines in my slides. Uh, one is that uh, the D Danske Bank's AML case and the settlement uh, shows that AML doesn't pay. Uh, we got incentives right. We need to maintain incentives right. But we also need to move in terms of technology uh, to a new level. And that's the second punchline uh, 
we need public-private partnership in order to fight AML in an efficient way. Uh, I'll see if I succeed now in going to the next page. I do. Uh, this was the December 2022 settlement. It was a historically large fine to the bank, $2 billion US dollars, bank for misleading information to the market and violation of the Danish AML CCF Act, as well as the Danish Financial Service Act. Approximately 750 million went uh, to uh, the Danish authorities, the rest to the US authorities. It's a fine of more than 10% of market cap. So it's, 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 it's very substantial. I think it's one of the largest, if not the largest in terms of market cap. For those of you uh, who haven't had the painful experiences I've had of following the Danske Bank Estonia case, just a very, very, very quick recap. Uh, what happened in Estonia was significant violations of European and Estonian ML rules in Danske Bank's Estonian branch. 15,000 non-resident clients had 200 billion euros of transactions going through the bank from 2007 to 2015. There were employees in the Estonian branch who actually carried out and caught up the violations, uh, large deficiencies in all three lines of defense. And by all standards, this was a deplorable case. What happened at the Copenhagen headquarters was that there was an inadequate control environment. There were lacking and insufficient information to the DFSA, as well as to US as correspondent banks, misleading information to the US market. And I think one of the, the key things was that the CEO was not challenged either from below or above. So there was massive failure and cultural problems. What were the implications? Uh, this is, by the way, my book <laughs> on the fall of finance. Uh, and I think the front page goes to show some of the implications because there were huge implications for the bank itself. All management uh, uh, which were implicated have gone. The implications for the Danish economy was not, was not large, but the case has led to a public outcry, negative reactions from politicians, a market fall in public trust in the banks, public queries on the role of the DFA. DFSA, and, and the view was a little bit, first the financial crisis, and then you did this to us. How could you? Uh, here are some lessons, uh, 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 which I'm happy to pass on uh, to colleagues who come in a similar situation. One is go for global resolution. It's a possibility offered by U.S. authorities for global settlement. It's the opposite of sequential settlement with each authority, which where the best example was BNP Paribas in relation to its Swiss branch, which didn't go down well. Uh, uh, it closes the case in, in, in one go. Uh, but there's no free lunch. It takes a lot of time when you have to get different authorities to agree. And here the settlement took uh, uh, four years. The second thing is that a stress test cap is incredibly important. A stress test cap sets a limit to what the bank, what the bank can pay without coming into conflict with capital requirements and stress. The potential fines when it comes to money laundering are very high. In Denmark, it says 25% of transactions. And if that had been used, uh, the bank would have had to pay three times the market cap and we would have had a financial stability problem. And the purpose of finding the bank is obviously the shareholder of pay. Management must take responsibility, but we don't want the taxpayer to pay at the end of the day. So therefore, the stress test cap is generally accepted uh, in both the Danish legislation and US practice. The third thing is cooperate. Uh, uh, we as supervisors know a lot about what's happening. We can provide and should provide input into the law enforcement. Uh, and we also the ones who have the capacity and capability to conduct stress tests. Um, it's also a good advice to the bank to cooperate. Danske Bank received credit for its cooperation. And I think anybody who has tried to work with US authorities know that it's not a good idea to play hardball. If I may then turn to the second uh, topic in terms of enhancing the fight against financial crime through technology and cooperation. We had a project called AML Tech. Uh, we acknowledge that a lot of stuff has been done over the last many years. Uh, anecdotally, we know that 10 to 15 percent of the resources in big banks are used on preventing money laundering and terrorist financing. And a third of our inspections as a supervisor uh, are in the area of AML CCF. Uh, we also have a lot of cooperation with, with other authorities. But, but I think the efforts are hampered by manual processes, high cost and limited possibilities to cooperate and lack of access to high quality public data. We can see that the number of suspicious activity reports have gone through the roof, uh, and, uh, but we need to be more efficient in terms of what we are sending. We can't have a system where in doubt send a suspicious activity report uh, and, and then leave it to the FAU to work things out. The European debate seems very much focused on enhancing uh, supervision. 
I think we have to recognize that although we play an important role as supervisors, we are supporting actors and actresses, ensuring the quality control in obliged entities. But the real key part of the value chain is between the obliged entities, the financial intelligence unit and law enforcement. And, and we need to improve that part of the value chain. The obliged entities are the front line. Uh, uh, we think that technology can create a triple win situation through higher quality, better allocation of resources, and less intrusion for customers. I don't go to a dinner or lunch party where uh, people do not complain about the things they have to file to their banks. At the same time, they are outrageous in relation to what the banks do in terms of money laundering. We need to somehow link those two things, and we must be brave as supervisors in terms of also taking those steps. There's one big issue, and that's data protection, justice, and the right to privacy. And, and we need to balance these things in terms of proportionality, consequences for the individual. And the European Union rightly has a convention on human rights, which sets limits uh, that you cannot infringe on privacy without due process, legal basis, and legitimate purposes. At the same time, MD4 states that the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing is recognized as an important public interest ground by member states. We need to find that balance. We need to have that discussion in the open. It's probably one of the most important discussions uh, we can have in relation to these issues. Let me just, at the end, flag seven initiatives uh, uh, which we have outlined in our report. Three of them relate to better use of existing infrastructures. We need to build KYC utilities and support the banks in building them. We need to use the business registers in order to verify who the businesses are. We need to lift the quality of the information there. We need to need, use the electronic IDs, the individual electronic IDs, which individuals have in this country and many other countries in order to make it easier to verify who they are. We need to build better solutions for PEP, the politically exposed persons, and particularly in relation to the relatives and close associates, which are very difficult to identify. We need to build generalized scenarios uh, which can be used uh, and, and, and the police and others have much better information on how to do that in the bank. We need increased access to data held by authorities and maybe in a fast stretch, we also need a sharing of risk flags between the banks. But here we are on the edge of what privacy uh, would restrict us to do. We, the Germans and the Dutch have sent in a suggestion in relation to the AMLA discussion and, and uh, the discussions on the new directive which would uh, uh, address those issues and we very much hope to make progress in these areas. If I may end on an anecdote, uh, uh, Ben Bananga in, in a speech at the American Economic Association said that the only time that, that he had peace during the financial crisis was when he had root channel surgery. I can tell you that the Dan Danske Bank uh, money laundering case caused a loss of four teeth for me because I didn't have time to go to root channel surgery. So it was expensive, painful, and a lot of other stuff, but hopefully uh, we have learned from it and, and can move ahead. Thank you a lot. Wow, that was impressive. Uh, thank you, Jesper. Uh, you can uh, now unshare your screen. And um, David. Hello, I have not lost any teeth uh, while focusing on banks. I have lost a lot of sleep, though. Um, Basically, my experience with this kind of stuff is in the kind of the two formative experiences I've had covering banks over the past two decades. One was with Citigroup in the years leading up to and during the global financial crisis. And the second was with Deutsche Bank in the years after the financial crisis. And, you know, as I was thinking about this before the session and then just listening to Jesper speaking, I think there's kind of two overarching things I, I would mention. The first and as it pertains to financial malfeasance and the lack of controls and incentives at these big banks. The first is that from a regulatory standpoint, what I've seen over two decades is that the pendulum kind of swings back and forth and therefore the behavior at banks swings back and forth. And I feel like right now we might be in one of those moments where the pendulum has swung pretty far towards banks having learned the lessons and realized that if they are caught doing money laundering or having, you know, market manipulation schemes or tax avoidance schemes, things like that. They are not only going to get caught, but they are the hammer is going to come down pretty hard, pretty rapidly on them. And so I think that has, you know, at the moment, I, I would guess that if you were to look around the banking industry, you would see that we're at a relatively kind of safe point in terms of the behavior 
of banks and bank executives. But I would caution that at least based on my experience covering this stuff for, which is only a couple of decades, it's not that long in the grand scheme of things, but based on my experience, this pendulum swings pretty rapidly and pretty far in both directions. And, you know, it wasn't very long after the 2008 financial crisis that when, you know, regulators came in very aggressively and started policing and cleaning things up with much more assertively than they had in the past, that outliers like Deutsche Bank and Danske Bank really became much more aggressive and seized what they perceived as an opportunity to fill a void left by other banks that had all of a sudden become more risk averse. And I think it's easy in a moment like this to say, well, look, regulators have acted swiftly and decisively in cases like Danske Bank. We're not seeing any scandals on the horizon right now. Ergo, the industry has gotten the message. And I, I think the the institutional memories at most of these places tend to be pretty short. And in my experience, that tends to be the case, not only at the banks, but also at the regulators. Uh, the second kind of broad th thing that I would mention is that, again, in, in my experience covering both Citigroup and Deutsche Bank, which, you know, at their various moments were the two biggest basket cases in the global financial system, is that so much of, I mean, there are a lot of different factors that cause banks to get into serious trouble and to commit crimes and things like that. But the biggest kind of standout to me is a cultural one, which is that, you know, people respond, humans respond to incentives and they tend to do what they perceive to be in their short-term self-interest. And so if you take a trader at a big bank, they have a pretty asymmetrical kind of view of their risk and rewards and that they, if they make a lot of money in the short term, they're going to get a cut of that in terms of their, their bonus. If they lose a lot of money or if they get caught 10 years later, or the bank gets caught 10 years later, having done made that money through illicit or improper means, the banker very rarely, or the trader very rarely has to actually pay any money back. They might lose their job, but they are not going to, have to share in the losses that are suffered by the bank or in some cases by taxpayers as well. And, and certainly not by shareholders. And in fact, so they have a very asymmetrical risk profile where there's basically very little downside risk and there's virtually infinite upside risk. And I think that culture has spread in very, you know, widely through the banking industry where we look at the incentives that banks institutionally and maybe top management have to 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 not commit wrongdoing and and you just mentioned Jasper the the penalty the finan the huge financial penalties leveled against Danske and that's been true for other banks as well and that those are that's pain borne by shareholders which often includes the top executives in my experience though that type of fine has a very limited effect in uh deterring behavior at the middle management level and the kind of the rank and file level where traders and their managers and bankers and their managers are really incentivized still to meet quarterly financial targets and if or annual financial targets. And if they do that, they are richly rewarded. And if they don't, they are penalized in terms of no bonus or small bonus or sometimes even losing their job. And that creates, you know, the that means that the moment that upper senior management takes their eyes off the ball and starts kind of chasing quarterly results, it's very easy for the whole organization to kind of switch to pursuing things that in a more conservative environment would not normally be considered kosher. And that I think most regulators would be fairly alarmed by. So to me, the I, I think it maybe is not quite right to look at the huge financial penalties that have been imposed against all sorts of big banks in the past decade and say, well, they've kind of learned that's obviously a huge cost to them and to their shareholders. And therefore, since they these institutions are rational actors, they are not going to make the same mistakes again. And the, to me, the problem with that thinking is that the institutions, you know, don't have feelings and thoughts. It's the people running them and the people kind of executing deep in the bowels of these organizations that do have incentives. And those incentives have not necessarily changed based on the imposition of fines or other penalties against on an institutional level. Jesper, do you want to react to that or do we take it directly to the discussion? No, 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 I can. I, I, uh, I, I don't think we disagree fundamentally. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, fully share the view that uh, incentives need to be maintained. Uh, 
I, I can promise you that as a regulator, uh, you, you cannot rely on just getting your salary for a year or two. Uh, you need to have a long-term memory. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, 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 it's, it's asymmetric in the sense that the upside is fairly limited, but the downside is it's pretty significant. Uh, I, I agree with you that, um, uh, in, particularly in investment banks, uh, uh, the uh, uh, in economic incentives matter a lot. I think it's different in uh, many of the universal banks you have uh, because the upside is not that big there either. I mean, it's basically a question of having your job uh, and, and, and the downside is pretty significant. So, so I would think that, of course, we should maintain the pressure which we have at present. But I think if we are to do additional things in terms of fighting money laundering, we need uh, to, uh, uh, the, the, the way you would get most bang for the buck is uh, by uh, uh, providing uh, more information, uh, which the public sector has to the frontline employees, which, where I think that most of the frontline employees uh, generally want to do a good job. I mean, they're not paid enormous sums of money. Uh, 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 and and uh, if we can support their work, and particularly their, their possibility to report the right stuff to the FIUs, I think that's where we will get more bang for the box than, than on, in some, on some of the other issues. But we should maintain the pressure on banks in relation to being quality assurance and, and, and keep the fines there. I don't uh, see them going away. You're, you're muted. Edward. Sorry. <laughs> After three years, well, um, uh, you mentioned um, Jesper in your presentation. Um, so I'm not discussion, and um, uh, of course that refers to the European Union discussion to create a non-money laundering authority. So I'm not uh, in the acronym. Um, so I, I there's a question from Josh Kirschenbaum uh, about whether AMLA this initiative to create a, a, a new level agency addresses the root causes of the Danske case. Uh, and more generally, what do you expect uh, from that uh, um, reform um, uh, in terms of changes in the, in the landscape and the incentives are being understood that AMLA will only be up and running, I guess, in uh, you know two, three years time? I think AMLA, uh was generally driven by the Danske narrative as well as other narratives in terms of failure. Uh, I think that uh, most uh, national supervisors have upped their game substantially since then. Uh, and I think that those managing AMLA when it comes into being needs to think about how do we create the most added value. Uh, uh, and I think we create added value by being quality controllers on the and national competent authorities. But I think where we can really create added value is by taking the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing to a new level. And, and here I also mentioned that a lot of the uh, restrictions on what we can share in terms of information also is at the European level. So it, I will not be running the AMLA. Yeah, I'm too old. <laughs> and then probably a lot of other things attached to my name. But if I was to run the AMLA, I would look into how can I lift the game through the use of technology and avoid uh, duplicating what uh, those national authorities who do a good job do. Uh, obviously, there might be national authorities here or there who, who need assistance and, and they should be helped. Uh, uh, but, but I think that, that would be my focus. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that the AMLA could end up uh, fighting the last war and uh, that uh, it could uh, uh, result in turf fights. And particularly the AMLA and the SSM uh, has potential similar responsibility in relation to governance issues and fit and proper issues. And, and uh, uh, we, we need to avoid uh, destructive turf wars uh, between European institutions as well as between national institutions and focus on where we can do better. You mentioned the SSM, of course, that's a single supervisory uh, mechanism at the European Central Bank. Uh, you've uh, you've worked at the ECB yourself, Jesper, I mentioned that, uh, despite Denmark not being in the Eurozone, but that's not uh, an obstacle. Uh, and uh, and um, the ECB has been, in their public communication, pretty supportive uh, of the creation of FAMLA, but, uh, but, but that's, uh, in your experience, not enough to prevent turf wars, right? No, I, I think I've sometimes said that sort of being responsible 
for the fight against money laundering and 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 terrorist financing is a responsibility you wouldn't want to give to your best friend, but you want you to give to your worst friend. So I think the, the SSM has been very cognizant of that, that uh, this is a job uh, which uh, uh, involves enormous risks to the institution. Already the fact that the SSM is at the ECB was something which was questioned way back because of the risks for the central banks who need to be sort of the oracles from Delphi who could not be attacked on anything. And you will be attacked as a supervisor, but I can tell you, you will be even more attacked as somebody who's responsible for fighting money laundering and terrorist financing. And therefore, I think the SSM rightly said, we don't want to deal with that, push it to somewhere else. Uh, uh, but, but I think reality is when you look at some of the tasks that at the end of the day, and, and David also alluded to it, a lot of the uh, root causes of money laundering and terrorist financing relates to governance and incentives. And they're the same things which apply when it comes to supervising in general. Uh, uh, so therefore, uh, 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 there will be discussions in terms of who uh, will make the calls in relation to those issues in terms of governance structures, in terms of risk management, and in terms of fit and proper discussions. And 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 we we don't want turf wars. They are so destructive. So we we need to work out how these things are split. David, have you observed these uh, turf uh, issues in Europe at all? Oh yeah, I mean that is Deutsche Bank was a huge beneficiary of these turf wars. I mean there was a, uh, I mean this is you know, a decade ago now for the most part. So the regulatory infrastructure has changed. But I mean, Deutsche Bank was masterful at playing the Fed off of other US regulators, off of Boffin, off of the ECB, off of the, what was at the time, the FSA in the UK. And it, it was, it was just, it was an explicit strategy at inside the bank to play these different regulators off each other and to get Boffin, which at the time was the bank's primary regulator uh, in Germany to basically play defense on behalf of the bank and fend off other regulators in, in particular from the UK and the US. And that, I mean, I, I, in the reporting, I did on Deutsche Bank, I and mean, that was something that was extremely frustrating to American and British regulators. And the some of the Deutsche Bank executives in candid moments and with me were just, they thought it was hilarious. And they would, it was, they knew exactly what they were doing and it worked extremely well. And I think for the most part, I think one of the great things, you know, I'm a journalist, so I have kind of, a, speaking of incentives, like a different set of incentives than you guys do. I mean, I like a good story and I like digging into a big scandal. So I realize maybe our incentives aren't quite perfectly aligned there. But uh, to me, like, it was a great story in part because Deutsche Bank was such a catastrophe on so many different levels. And it I'm not sure most banks are that explicit and that gleeful about playing the regulatory arbitrage game. Uh, but certainly the fact that it was able to be played at all, I think was very telling. And I, I, you know, a lot of regulators, I think would say that that was a learning experience for them. And I'm just honestly not sure to what extent that has changed or if, you know, five years from now, we're going to be discussing another big scandal where it turns out that the regulators were not clearly communicating with each other, or maybe fighting to protect their hometown banks, which is what happened with Deutsche? Well, in terms of Baffin, uh, we have uh, an observation by Pierre Raffi on the Q&A suggesting that Baffin's uh, defensive stance, I read, in such issues was clearly exemplified again by the Wirecard case. And I, I think yep. that's, been, yep. uh, that's been pretty extensively reported. Um, I, and I, I would say, I think Baffin more than probably any other regular, maybe the Italian regulators as well. I mean, to me, Baffin exemplifies the worst regulatory practices I've ever encountered. I mean, there was, and nothing personal about them. I've just, the, the fact, the way that they were playing defense on behalf of their hometown financial institutions was, it was just counter to everything that I think most regulators would say they stand for, which is the goal is to fend off crises and instability. And everything they were doing was, it was about preserving their own power and their own tax base, essentially. And that is not really, that, that's just not the mission of most regulators, I would say. Uh, 
you you refer to Italy. Do you have particular cases in in mind? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole series of Italian uh, banking sales. And Mata de Paschi is the one that most kind of obviously jumps to mind. But I mean, I did some reporting. This is back, got a long time ago now, probably ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, where it, there was like Bafin was restricted, or I think the Bank of Italy was restricting Deutsche Bank from some of the operations that it wanted to do in Italy. And Bafin then retaliated against, uh, I believe it was Unicredit or maybe another Italian bank that was trying to branch into Germany. And, you know, all of the European, this is again, this has changed in the new regulatory infrastructure, but banks were using all over Europe and in the US to a lesser extent. They were using this notion of having branches versus actually subsidiaries in the in various countries to basically kind of essentially sneak into countries without having to face the full regulatory oversight that they would normally receive. And Italy and Germany were doing this. The, both the banks and the regulators were kind of exchanging in this tit for tat uh, exchanges that, I mean, again, were it was about protecting home turf, home power, and local tax bases more than it was protecting financial stability. At least that was the way I perceived it as a journalist writing about it at the time. Maybe the regulators, presumably the regulators would have a different viewpoint on it. The period you covered at Deutsche Bank, uh, if I remember correctly, encompasses the transition from Baffin to the ECB as primary prudential supervisor. Are there any observations you made of that transition? You know, not really, to be honest with you. I mean, there was uh, that that was late enough in my reporting process that it was really hard to see the effect that that was going to have. I mean, it was uh, and especially because the primary and, you know, the ECB, I think, has a much better reputation than Boffin has. And it's just much less toothless, I guess. Uh, but it, that didn't, auto, from my perspective at least, that didn't automatically solve kind of the central tension here, which was that it was European regulators versus British regulators versus American regulators. And obviously the UK regulators were not, or certainly did not perceive themselves as subservient to the ECB. Uh, and so it was, it, there was still this kind of tripartite system where the regulators all had different perspectives and different approaches. I, I do think, though, that the ECB was much less beholden to, even though it was obviously, you know, based in Germany, was much less beholden to the local German financial institutions, whether it was uh, Wirecard or Deutsche Bank, than Baffin had been. Yes, Per, this was obviously a dimension of the Danske case, uh, and uh, specifically, of course, between Denmark and Estonia. Uh, and, and the Estonian operation was a branch, not a subsidiary that was also part of the story. Can you give us a bit more of that experience of the kind of cross-border dimension, uh, interaction between different authorities, uh, regulatory arbitrage, and how it played out uh, for Danske? Yeah, uh, let, let, let me start by saying that uh, my Estonian colleagues uh, 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 took some incredibly courageous steps in terms of shutting down uh, the non-resident portfolio of Danske in 2014. I, I think all of us knows, and if we didn't knew it then, we know it now, that if you border Russia and if you interfere uh, in, in, in some of their affairs, uh, you do so at a not inconsiderable risk to your own health. So I, I think my Estonian colleagues and uh, deserves a lot of praise for, for what they did in 2014. And, and which led to the bank shutting down its portfolio in, in 2015. We, we, there, there were complaints uh, 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 from various sites that uh, we and the Estonians and didn't cooperate well. I, I know that, uh, and this was before I arrived, so I would give credit to my predecessors. In, I arrived in 2015 uh, that uh, uh, we actually counted 132 exchanges on money laundering issues in, in the years from 2007 to 2015 between us and the Estonians. And uh, we uh, uh, also established the first AML college, actually in relation to Danske Bank, uh, where we had discussions with the various regulators. I, I think that, um, I mean, we, uh, countries like Denmark and Estonia are very much aware that they're small countries. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there's less 
general protection in these small countries of their national institutions than you see in bigger countries, and there's less models to do so. Uh, uh, the the uh, I remember when I was at the ECB, we once had this cultural uh, exercise where where the story was that sort of the Germans believed there was one thing right, uh, and the Scandinavians and the Dutch always sort of uh, talked about, okay, you remember last week when we sat around and drank tea and agreed on we would do this or that. And, and that, that's pretty much the approach across Scandinavia and also with our Baltic friends that, that uh, uh, we tend to sit down and talk about things. So, so although we were criticized heavily, I, I would make the point that I think uh, uh, we were much better at talking together uh, than uh, most of the authorities from the big countries would tend to be more insular in terms of how they deal with issues. And, and I think, my, again, my Estonian colleagues, I mean, deserve immense credit. Uh, they had the responsibility, according to AML directives, in relation to uh, that, that, that it's a host country issue. And, and they really hit the ball hard in 2014. All of us would have wished in hindsight, including us, that we had been uh, understood better what was happening. Uh, 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 but, but I think that the kind of action which was taken uh, uh, was, was really, when you look at the security risk, fairly impressive. And of course, uh, Kilvar Kessler is the head of the Estonian Financial uh, Supervisory Authority since 2014, uh, has spoken in this series last year about the operation of the single supervisory mechanism. So the yeah. episode is still yeah. available uh, in replay. Uh, it was a it was a great uh, episode as well. Yeah. You mentioned the friend. non. The, the, you mentioned, uh, Jesper, the 15,000 non-resident clients. Uh, to give us more of a sense of what actually happened, and to be honest, I don't know because I haven't read all the publicly available documentation, and I'm not sure everything is in the publicly available uh, documentation, but 15,000 sounds like a lot of different people or entities. Uh, were they all uh, problems, or was it very concentrated in a limited number of uh, client accounts? Can you give us more of a sense of... You know what was exactly the issue? What uh, what happened? No, no. I think I think I mean the uh, <laughs> we, we live in Denmark in a country which is very transparent for good and bad, and I think that uh, uh, there's no other case where uh, there's been a publication of the number of transactions, the number of customers, to the extent that we've seen in Danske. I think if you try to figure out how many transactions went through Deutsche Bank or HSBC or BNP Paribas or Susan Rail, you will have to look hard for the numbers. And uh, But but in Denmark, that's not an option. Uh, you need to publish whatever you have or you're, you are screwed at the some later stage. Uh, I think the, the, uh, uh, the 15,000 accounts were everybody from but there were no sanctions busting uh, 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 but it was everybody uh, uh, in, in in Russia uh, uh, the uh, I think in order to understand the amount of transactions going through the bank and and, and not trying to make any excuse uh, in the Danish payment system uh, the uh, 1500 uh, uh, the 200 billion euros would be what goes through the Danish payment systems in two days. And, and, and this is what went through the bank in uh, seven, eight years. Uh, 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 I, they should have discovered it uh, because uh, the Estonia branch was not that big. Uh, 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 and and it, they failed in discovering it, and, and that was deplorable. Uh, uh, but, but I think one has to remember when you speak about transactions uh, that there's a lot of money going around. Uh, uh, and therefore, it, it's not always uh, that easy from outsiders, including the FIU in Estonia, to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, uh, but, but I think that it was everything from capital flight to tax evasion to uh, criminal proceeds being laundered. Uh, and we don't know the exact distribution uh, uh, because finding out in Russia, I mean, it's, it's not like you call the Russian authorities and then say, here are the accounts, tell us, is this flight counsel, tax evader, criminal, or is it one of Putin's friends? Uh, you, you are not likely to get <laughs> very good information if you do that sort of stuff. Can I just ask a quick question in response to that? There is, I mean, to me, that's a kind of the fact that, you know, the amount of money that was flowing through this Estonian branch that was improper, that that was hard to detect in part because there's so much more money flowing around. To me, I guess I wonder whether that is not a compelling argument 
that a lot of banks are too big to manage. You know, if you can't keep track of where what your customers are doing and what money you're routing and whether you're violating sanctions or, in, uh, you know, enabling money laundering or other crimes, maybe David, you're I'm not, too big. David, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of big banks. Uh, in addition to this incident, uh, this country had to issue a guarantee of two times GDP uh, 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 at the start of the financial crisis. I, 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 one of Negrinas and my uh, other favorite topic is, is bank resolution. And I can tell you bank resolution is a lot easier with a small and medium sized bank than with a large bank. So, so I'm, 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 uh, uh, I, and I, th I think we do it to some extent. I mean, we do try to police big banks uh, harder than, than small banks. But I think that is also uh, uh, reflects that uh, uh, big banks are really tricky. Uh, 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 and uh, so I would fully agree with you that, that uh, uh, one should be very cautious in terms of uh, sort of uh, making the argument that we need big banks in order to have economics of scale across Europe in order to drive consumer benefits, because I think there are a lot of negative externalities related to big banks. Yeah, you I was really... there... yeah go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm just with my journalist hat on right now. So it, I'm sorry for being persistent, but I mean, do, should regulators play a more active role in uh, encouraging banks in Europe to shrink? I, I, I think the way uh, we do it is that we post larger requirements. Uh, the, in terms of uh, capital, if, if you look at the issue of resolution, which is dear to Nicholas in my heart, uh, uh, we, we basically ask big banks to have double the amount of capital uh, uh, in terms of uh, what we call MREL, minimum required liabilities in, in global terms, it's called TLAC. It's one of those many abbreviations. Uh, we, so, 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 and, and also in terms of our uh, money laundering policing, uh, we are much more uh, on the big banks uh, uh, is published uh, that we've had for some years a monitor in inside Danske Bank, just like the U.S. authorities would have. Uh, so, so we are more intrusive, and to the extent that we get the balance right, which I'm not saying we get, we could say that that tilts the incentives away from the big banks uh, uh, are, are more profitable, uh, isolated, so that we also include the externalities in what we do. I, I don't know whether we get the balance right. Uh, uh, but but I'm, I'm I'm deeply suspicious of the argument that uh, uh, we just need a few mega banks in Europe because then we really have our hands full in terms of lobbying and in terms of potential resolution problems. Um, I'd like to go back and maybe that uh, connects to uh, some uh, well-known French banks uh, to precedent. Uh, there, there's a there's a question from Ted Truman about whether the resolution of the Danske Bank case uh, drew anything from the experience of BCCI back uh, now, what, uh, 30 years ago. Um, and um, Ted also asked if the costs of the AML regime are worth the benefits, which I guess goes back to uh, your uh, slides about recommendations. But, but thinking more broadly about the precedents, we had BCCI, we had BNP Paribas with Sudan and, uh, and Cuba and Iran. Um, how how did that inform the way uh, Danske Bank was handled, uh, Jesper? Clearly, uh, the lessons, uh, which probably are more of a generic nature in relation to BCCI, and, and, and more of a specific nature in relation to BNP Paribas, was that you want to do global resolution. You uh, and in that sense, you want to cooperate internationally because you want one settlement which takes into regard. Uh, all the claims made, and then you can share the fines. And and I should add that at the end of the day, my feeling is that the U.S. authorities work more on uh, uh, the issue of uh, incentives and the total size of the fine rather than what goes to the U.S. or what goes to some other countries. So also in that way, the global resolution process is, is, is much more beneficial than the route which was taken on BNP by back. Uh, uh, in terms of no, I have whether... to ask, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask a question. If that lesson was plain from BCCI, um, and I mean, you're not obliged to answer that question, but is there is there any explanation why the French authorities didn't, uh, you know, no, no, uh, I, I think uh, that use that with them? That was that was why I said the BCCI case was more tricky because it wasn't necessarily. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of money laundering involved, but there was a lot of other issues in relation to other. So I don't think it was that apparent from BCCI. Uh, that you needed to do uh, uh, the global resolution. I think that was a more specific lesson which all of us learned uh, uh, by the BNP buyback case. Uh, 
I, th I think that the uh, the other question of whether this is worth it, uh, uh, I think I think there are two answers to it. Uh, I think that uh, if you want to be part of the world uh, in which uh, the U.S. is the big power, it, uh, you, you cannot ask that question because the, for the U.S., the uh, money laundering uh, regulations are such an important part of their foreign policy that that I mean you do not have a choice. Uh, but I would even uh, 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 to play by the rules of, of that part of society. And, and, and again, given the choice between different global regions and different global powers, I much prefer to be in the US orbit than in some of the other orbits. Uh, uh, the, the, the other thing is worth the price for society itself. Yes, I do think it is worth the price. I think in many ways, uh, 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 you, you could put it the way that uh, as Western societies, we are incredibly dependent on uh, the trustworthiness and, and, and the confidence in society, the trust in society that you cannot use institutions uh, to launder money uh, or to uh, uh, corrupt uh, uh, civil servants uh, uh, and, and, and other stuff. So, so, so I think that hammering the down on these things is fundamental. But I think I, I agree with, with Ted that, that uh, the costs are enormously high. And that is why I also think we need to move from what I would call first or second generation blood, sweat and pencils and paper to something where we use data much more and which we can do in a much less intrusive manner and a, and a much higher level of efficiency with the caveat that we need to expect, uh, respect privacy and, and find the right balance there. David? I, you know, I'm, I, I'm just to be candid, I'm a little out of my depth here. Like there's, I don't know, there's one of the great things about being a journalist is that I don't have to make decisions about uh, policies or how to, you know, enforce rules. Uh, I'm much better at spotting and diagnosing and observing things. Uh, to me, like one of the fascinating kind of elements of all of this is that there is, look, I have an outsider's perspective, right? And it's, uh, I'm sure that I don't appreciate the uh, the complexity and nuances of actually doing a job like what you do, Jesper. It's, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't really have anything to add beyond that. Uh, you mentioned Jesper's uh, trade-off with privacy, and there was a ruling uh, last year or the year before, I don't remember, of the European Court of Justice that struck down the uh, transparency requirements on beneficial ownership, which was widely uh, viewed by the anti-corruption, anti-money laundering uh, community in Europe and beyond uh, as a major setback. Uh, so the European Court of Justice uh, appeared as it was <laughs> objectively siding uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, bad actors in uh, making the life of the um, enforcers more difficult. Uh, how did you view that case? What is being done to remedy it? Uh, is it a, a fatal blow to uh, the fight against money laundering in Europe or is it being overcome? Can you update us on it? I, I, I don't know what is specifically being done, but I, I would, on the one hand, hate to criticize uh, a court uh, which uh, upholds privacy regulations uh, against uh, uh, governments and other authorities. I, I, th I think that's an important role for courts, and, and, I, uh, and, and uh, I'm happy that we have courts who, who take that stand. At the same time, I think at the end of the day, courts decide on things based on legislation, uh, some of it very fundamental and difficult to change, other parts of it, things which politicians can change. I think we need to have a broad discussion in uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, in the general public, involving a lot of stakeholders on how we balance these sort of things. Uh, I think we need uh, 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 to, to acknowledge that there are trade-offs and, and figure out uh, uh, how do we how do we make the most out of it given those trade-offs? Uh, the uh, one of the proposals we had in our AML Tech report was exactly to use uh, the uh, corporate registers, including information on beneficial owners, to verify uh, 
uh, the identity of, of corporates. Uh, and, and I still think that would be a sensible thing to do. I, I fail to understand uh, that uh, corporates put in data in, in these corporate registers and on beneficial ownership. And, and uh, somehow uh, we can't use it in the fight. Uh, or, or actually, it's, it's something which makes it easier for the corporates when they have to do deals with their banks uh, and to report on who they are. If, they could, if the banks could use that sort of information, it would ease the burden on corporates. Uh, but, but I'm not uh, a specialist on all the privacy issues related to these things. But, but it seems to me that, that, I mean, we could do things much smarter uh, one requirement, of course, uh, if, if we were to use that data, much more efficient, we could link things up. Uh, one requirement, of course, is that we are sure that the data on beneficial ownership is valid. And therefore, we need some way of certifying it either to lawyers or uh, 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 auditing firms or somewhere else. But, but we need to make that link in order to cut out a lot of the wasted resources to the benefit both of corporates, banks and society at large. Nicola, you're mood muted. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, sorry. Uh, you work a lot on uh, lawyers and, uh, and and enablers, David. Uh, did you did you follow the European case and uh, and and how big uh, of a piece of the landscape are these debates about beneficial ownership and corporate registries? Yeah, I mean, I I totally agree with what Jasper just said. That there, I mean, it's crazy to me that there that so much of this data is off limits. It's frankly, as a journalist, it's absolutely infuriating too that you reach, you trying to figure out who owns what, whether it's real estate or a company or whatever, and you just like hit these dead ends. And I mean, honestly, the U.S. is as big a part of a problem in this as anywhere else, right? I mean, the U.S., like states like Delaware are really the like, in the U.S., we always talk about this as a problem with offshore tax havens and with no disclosure requirements. And the state of Delaware is like among the worst in the world at this. And so I, it's this is kind of an international problem. And I think that there's look, there's a whole class of lawyers and consultants and accountants and uh, registrars and fake board directors and things like that all over the world that specialize in making it extremely easy to set up an LLC or another entity with zero uh, visibility to the outside world. And it's, you know, it's, it's just a huge problem. So there's, uh, and I think the role, again, this is maybe not of interest to anyone other than me, but there's, to me, this is a role, a, a space where the media can play and is playing uh, an important role at pushing for as much disclosure as possible, trying to use sources or leaks sometimes to uh, provide transparency in in corners of the world where there is none. And I haven't been involved in any of this reporting, but I mean, there's obviously been a bunch of very high profile journalism projects over the past decade that are based on huge leaks of uh, private information, for, whether it's from law firms or private banks and places like that, that, you know, in some cases serves really as an antidote to this complete opacity in a huge part of the financial world. Uh, we have uh, questions about the kind of, you know, next frontier. You mentioned, uh, uh, the, you know, winning the next war, uh, Jesper. Uh, there's a question from Pierre Raffi on uh, CBDCs and how they will change the landscape or not in terms of, um, uh, you know, what is under the spotlight of regulators in terms of uh, transactions and uh, if uh, it's possible to project oneself already uh, into a CBDC world and what that will change in terms of uh, the fight against money laundering and financial crime. Uh, also, we have a, another question on the sharing of risk flags, specifically uh, asking whether you have explored the use of encryption technology to allow for greater information sharing between banks. So uh, any any comments on those um, forward looking issues? Yeah, I, I, I think those are very good questions. I think I'm with Ken Rogoff on, on, on uh, CBCDs in that. Um, uh, cash is probably uh, the best money laundering instrument you can have. And CBCDs potentially has the possibility to, to uh, uh, eradicate that advantage depending on uh, the right 
of courts and authorities uh, uh, with sufficient uh, guarantees to view the transactions in the blockchains. Uh, I mean, in, in an ideal world from a money laundering perspective, but not from a privacy perspective, obviously, uh, you, you could, uh, uh, if you had a, a, a judge deciding on it, go in and see all the transactions as opposed to cash. So, so I think that uh, CBCDs uh, uh, offer potential uh, uh, to uh, lift the fight against money laundering. In relation to uh, the sharing of flags, I don't think the issue is uh, an issue of uh, the uh, encryption. I think the issue is a question of whether uh, bank legislation and privacy legislation allow banks to share risk flags. And, and here, uh, uh, I mean, you can argue many ways around because you could make the argument that if for some unfortunate reason you've got a risk flag in a bank and that is shared by other banks, you become unbankable. And that may be unfair. And 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 uh, we already have a problem of financial inclusion in relation to money laundering, which we need to balance. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it's a little bit sad to see that when customers are thrown out in one bank, they can walk across the street to another bank. Uh, and, 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 uh, and the information which was collected in the first bank cannot be used by the second bank. Uh, I don't know how we square the circle in relation to these things, uh, 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 but we need to think about it. David, any comments on technology? Uh, did you observe any of these? Yeah, um, I mean, what, yeah. What, just listening to you talk just now, it what immediately came to mind is the situation I witnessed with Jeffrey Epstein in the U.S., who had been a longtime client of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan got, and after Epstein was initially uh, convicted of a sex crime, there he became, a, and you know, there's lots of other rumors swirling around. J.P. Morgan eventually severed ties with him, and it was extremely easy for him. Despite you know googling his name, you would come up with a zillion red flags. It was extremely easy for him to land another banking relationship. He ended up at Deutsche Bank, and uh, because of course, and um, but I, to me, one of the interesting things about that is not just the fact that banks sometimes are just act completely amorally uh, in terms of who they're doing business with. But I mean, that wasn't a technology issue. That wasn't an issue about proprietary information that JP Morgan had come across about the financial kind of sketchiness of anything he was doing. That was a simple Google search that would have alerted people to, um, uh, you know, who he was and what he had, what, what he was, what his history was. And, and I remember talking to some people in Deutsche Bank's anti-money laundering department down in Florida who had noticed this at the time that Epstein had come on board as a very lucrative client. And, you know, they had expressed their concerns up the food chain and were basically told to forget about it, to keep, to not, to stop kind of protesting and causing headaches for everyone because this was a potentially lucrative client. And so I, I guess I feel like sometimes, the, at least in the banking industry, they're the excuse that we're not allowed to share information with each other or with regulators, there's banking privacy laws and things like that is sometimes a red herring that they use to just kind of hide their the fact that banks often make decisions to do things that if they were to become public or if regulators were to come across them would really be viewed as objectionable. But, you know, again, in this case, there's nothing to do with information sharing or technology beyond typing a, a potential client's name into a search engine. Yes, sir. No, I, I mean, if, when it comes to Jeffrey Epstein and probably also very prominent figures, I would fully agree with, with David. But, but I think we, we, we are talking in, uh, in, in many of the cases about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, 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 where uh, uh, we could do things smarter uh, to the benefit of all. Uh, and 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 so so I fully agree on Jeff Epstein and probably many other high profile types who you can just uh, type in and Google. Uh, uh, and uh, but but I think uh, reality is that uh, uh, there are lots of people uh, uh, where you could ease uh, the information gathering substantially and and, and throw more money after where uh, the big fish are. 
Unfortunately, we're already at the hour, uh, so uh, we uh, will have to leave it there. But I, I'm very grateful again uh, to uh, Jesper Berg, to uh, David Enrich, and uh, to uh, all the participants also uh, who engaged on Zoom uh, for uh, a very uh, thought-provoking session. The so next one on March 21 will be about a very different topic. We'll talk about uh, insurance capital standards and international insurance capital standards. Uh, with um, uh, Romain Pasco uh, of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors in Basel. Um, one of your other duties, I guess, Jesper, but uh, in a different department of the FSA. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for participating in this session. Thanks a lot.